So, um, <coughs> as, uh, uh, as we were introduced, we're from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, we work on the Open Learning Initiative, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we brought OLI uh, into learning management systems. And this is actually a natural extension, I think, from where we started with the keynotes this morning and the discussion about uh, data exchange and systems interoperability. We'll talk about some of the, um, uh, the challenges that, that we ran into. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this thing plugged in? Doesn't seem like it's on. Right. Can you hear me any louder now? Yeah, use it. Hold it. Pull it up. Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'll try to talk louder also. Um, if, if you can't hear me, just like maybe down or something. Um, so first we're going to kind of make the case for uh, why OER should be in the LMS. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the standards that are out there now. Um, our approach, and I'd really like to hopefully move towards a discussion with all of you about some of the opportunities and challenges that are before us in terms of increasing the reach of and, and consumability of OER. Just a little context about who we are. Um, the Open Learning Initiative creates courses which try to enact instruction and support instructors. Um, we're here, so we're, we're trying to provide open access. And another piece of our work is to develop communities of use and research that enable uh, ongoing evaluation, ongoing continuous improvement of the OERs that we create. And so for us, um, the OER is about, uh, I'm sorry, the LMS is about increasing access. Um, we want to make things convenient for students and instructors. We don't want them to have to mess with multiple URLs, multiple websites to go to, multiple accounts, multiple grade books, multiple navigation schemas. Um, and, and actually, our, our users request access to OLI from the LMS quite frequently. Um, since access is, is part of our core mission, we believe that OER needs to be easier to find, and that's being addressed with new standards and metadata and search. Um, but we also think it needs to be easier to consume. And that means we consume in the context where it makes sense for users to use it. And we think the learning management system as the, whatever you think of LMSs, um, as the information help of the course, is really the place um, that we need to make some inroads. Standards. So why not building blocks, modules, plugins, the old way of doing things? Uh, well, simply there's too many platforms to target otherwise. There's lots of learning management systems. We want to hit all of them. Um, and in the past, you know, we've seen uh, this question we started with was, are these standards in, in name only? I think we all remember past conferences where we're doing the hack fest after, we have different vendors trying to get systems to work, or anyone who's trying to take content, even just a few years ago, and move it across systems, standards haven't been perfect. Um, and, but they're necessary to um, provide confidence in technologies that can be adopted. So we did a survey, and we realized that um, you know, we're more than just a simple content package that needs to be included. We have persistent state, multiple assignments, learning analytic components, um, that OER is becoming more sophisticated, which led us to the learning tools interoperability spec uh, from IMS. And what's really great about uh, basic LTI is it's really simple to implement. It's the idea of you're building tools, uh, things like uh, OLI, and you're bringing them into a tool consumer, things like an LMS. And there's just a simple trust relationship between the systems, fields to identify the user, the course, the institution. It's simple but powerful. Um, so I kind of hit on this, it's developed more systems, it's supposed to be easy to develop, it's supposed to be easy to consume, there's a pathway for more advanced features. Um, did that work in, work in practice? Uh, well, let's take a look at what we actually built. So we now have, um, this is just a screen capture from Blackboard, so we actually went ahead and we implemented basic LTI uh, on the OLI system, and what that gets you is we can now place a link to ROER from within Blackboard. And in two clicks, we can get to the course content. So the first click takes us to our research consent form, our research project. We do collect data on students, so we need their consent. And then students can jump right into the course. And so this is not, these two slides aren't actually, there's not a lot of magic here, because it's all happening behind the scenes. Um, what's happening when you click that link is we're actually doing a lot of work. We're figuring out who the user is in that LMS. We're creating their account in the OLI system. We're signing them in. We're creating their profile. We're dropping them into the right course. And all that happens transparently. Um, and that's the power of, this, of the basic LTI standards. It provides a path from the LMS uh, to OLI without actually having to uh, deal with things like user registration, user sign-in, getting students to the right place, getting them in the right course. And it makes it really easy just to jump right to your content. We now have one click, and actually as the students are working here, we're tracking their data, we know who they are, and they return their states persistent. So did it work as planned? Um, well, we ran into a number of challenges along the way, and um, I think rather than sort of dwelling on 
how we actually build things. I think this is really the area uh, we want to spend some time talking about because I think there's an opportunity um, here to improve the reach of OLI by addressing some of these challenges. And they're kind of on three fronts, technology, policy, uh, and user experience. And it really comes down to, we think, that standards today um, are designed primarily as a technology, not necessarily to serve user needs. Um, we feel like kind of current standards lean towards what content publishers are doing, what institutions are doing, but there's not enough focus on the actual instructors and learners who are consuming OER content or consuming content in general. Uh, the, the, the people that the standards affect, um, we're not actually getting uh, most of the benefit, and we'll sort of draw out why. Uh, first is sort of the technology issues. Um, some products require an extension. So it's supposed to be easy to use, it has wide vendor reach, um, but in order to use basic LTR, we have to make sure that you have the right version of your LMS, that it has the plugin enabled, that um, all the right features there. You might have to install some software. It's not, the technology is easy, but it's not automatic. <coughs> we also ran into some implementations which we found to be buggy. Uh, we actually had to write some patches for the Moodle plugin in order to accommodate Internet Explorer. So it, it's hard to uh, argue for adoption of these standards and tools if they don't work perfectly in every context as expected. Um, and on the development side, uh, the standard has actually is way more flexible than a lot of the other IMS standards, but, uh, which is a benefit, but also makes things complicated on the developer side. Our tools need to accommodate having zero information about the user, just a very opaque identifier, all the way up to all sorts of fields and information. We need to handle lots of cases where we're, the LMS is identifying to us the person's name, their course, their context, and cases where the LMS is only identifying just a, uh, an opaque identifier. And it makes it hard for us to build consistent experiences when the data that we get from different systems um, about the user is different. Um, the other thing that came up, which surprised us a bit, uh, were some of the policy and process uh, issues that we hit on. So anytime you're bringing two systems together, um, institutions take a closer look. And we thought that since a lot of institutions we're working with are already using OLI, um, they're used to having different students register, they're used to having uh, students' data come into the system, uh, that this wouldn't be as much of a question. Um, but in fact it was, and there was questions about ownership, does the registrar's office uh, own student registration data? Um, how do we find help for institutions to navigate the space about who to talk to in their institution, and what policies they have governing what their LMS can connect to? Um, you know, if we're targeting instructors as the end user consumer of OLI who are adopting, OLI, or adopting OER, uh, we need to think about how to support them if their institution has all sorts of policies about uh, data and privacy in terms of bringing things into the LMS. And I also like to add that um, the institutions we have worked with so far, we're piloting this technology at the moment, have been very eager to work with us, and we are nonetheless running into these process considerations. So imagine that you are an instructor at an institution that has not yet set up an LTI in their LMS, and you have to figure out, navigating your own university, who do I ask, how do I get this set up? So even these barriers, as big as they are, we're in almost the best case scenario. Which. Um which is another piece um, that I'll, I'll turn up the bill for, which is uh, the user experience component. So, uh, as John mentioned, one of the things that we feel is a problem with a lot of these standards, including, including basic LTI, is it's a technology. And it's not really addressing the users and what they need and what they uh, need to be doing in their workflow. I'm just going to yell, is that okay? So, why is good user experience critical to adoption? Uh, using a computer system is really easy for some, uh, but it, it's really not for a lot of people when you're trying to impose this or you're trying to improve your workflow. So for an instructor, they may not adopt the technology if it appears that it's complicating their lives. If it looks like it's a real difficulty to set up, they might consider it if they're highly motivated because they see the benefits, but if they don't see the benefits and how this is going to improve their workflow, they're not going to be interested. Uh, also about students. Uh, students who struggle with interfaces uh, all of a sudden have negative affect about what you're trying to teach them. I don't like working with that material, and therefore I, every time I go into it, I'm reminded that I don't like this experience. Uh, I'm just going to rattle through a few of the issues that came up. What we showed you with the two-click experience is really the best case. This is not uh, reflecting all the possible situations. So roster management. Uh, since we're relying on the LMS to tell us when students are registered, until the student initiates an action, we don't know who they are. So an instructor now has two rosters to manage their LMS and their OLI one. They now have two gradebooks. Until we can implement grade exchange, which requires more than what basic LTI can provide us, uh, you now have two gradebooks, and that's both for the student and the instructor. 
logins. So we can automatically log you in from the LMS. And at first we didn't even provide an OLI logout because what if we log you out but you're not logged out of your LMS and then you come back. Uh, but then people were concerned that they don't have a way to log out once they're in our system. So we had to put login back, but now we have students who can be logged out in one system, logged in another, and we need to handle those issues. Bookmarking. Basic LTI does not allow us to refer back to the authenticator to, to send back to us. So if you hit a bookmark from OLI, but you're not currently logged in, we have to kick you back to your LMS, but your LMS doesn't have a way to kick you back to us. <laughs> Desktop support. Where do the questions go? Do you have an OLI question, or do you have a Blackboard question or a Moodle question? How do we figure out what that question is, and what help desk to send it to? Does it go to us, or does it go to your home institution? Here's a big one. Where do you have your account? Do you have an OLI account, or do you have a Blackboard account? Well, that sounds like it should be an easy question to answer. You've got one or the other. Well, we have existed before we've done this basic LTI, so we have a lot of relationships with faculty who already have OLI accounts. The students already have OLI accounts. So for the case in Carnegie Mellon, we have to support both. Uh, for existing users, we have to support both. For everybody else, we decide, okay, you're an LMS-only account going forward. Maybe this will all sort itself out, right? Unless, of course, you're not using an LMS at your institution, then you want an OLI-only account. Um, oh, but you just found out that you could hook OLI up to your LMS. Maybe I want to do that. Can you merge my accounts together? Yeah, we can do that, um, but if you've already got students who are registered, now we're moving their registrations, and now you've got to tell your students they need to go log in somewhere else. Uh, the point of all of this is that it's not easy to communicate to novice users how they should be using this bridge between their LMS and OLI. Uh, so now suppose, okay, I've even decided, I've looked at all this and decided, that's okay, I don't mind two great books, I don't mind this funky logout thing, I don't mind the account confusion, I'm going to go set this up. Well. As I mentioned before, even in our best case scenarios, you still need to find out who you need to talk to to get things set up at your institution. Then when you have it set up at your institution, you have to go through something like this to actually configure the link. Yeah, which is highly technical. So this is there's actually multiple screens to set things up in Blackboard. You have to enable the basic LTI component. Then you have to register a provider domain. Not that anyone aside from maybe someone in IT knows what a provider domain is, providing credentials and secrets and those sorts of things. And then actually in the course, as an instructor, you're thinking about adding, I want to add this to my course, well, I have to first bring in that tool to the Blackboard course. And then, if that's, if that's not enough, I have to add a URL, because um, it, might not, it might not even be obvious. So I don't think of, uh, I know we are experienced as a URL that I'm adding, I'm thinking about it in a piece of courseware. So you find that, and then there's a little tiny checkbox that says, this, this URL is a tool. And you have to know what a tool means, because a tool could mean different things in, inside the LMS system. And to get all of that right is multiple clicks, multiple screens. There's no straightforward way to get set up and configured to consume in Blackboard. And other systems are the same. We found similar in Moodle. We found Sakai was a little bit easier, but still had a lot of technical language. It's not an easy thing to do. Well, and the point there is that depending on the LMS, it is different. What they yeah. call these things, what you have to go through, is different. So imagine trying to provide instructions from our side, from OLI's side, saying, uh, okay, uh, what LMS do you have? What version do you have? How is it configured? What have they done you know, for the pre-configuration? Um, and so, even though we can achieve these two-click scenarios through basic LTI, um, from a user experience point of view, there are so many rat holes that this can just fall apart through. And I really believe that the difficulty there is that this is a technology solution, not one that really pays attention to what's the user experience supposed to be like. And I really think that's critical for adoption. So what's next? So things that we're working on, um, we want to provide some more configurable entry points into OLI, so maybe you can jump right to uh, our learning dashboard, which is our learning analytics component, um, or other locations that instructor configurable. We want to do grade exchange, which we can do um, with something called full LTI, which is a larger spec, but that's harder on the development side. We actually have to do all sorts of web service stuff to make that happen, whereas basic LTI is more web 2.0. It's easy, it's just simple requests. Um, tool consumer, we're actually thinking about, well, what about bringing other tools into our environment? But I think really where we want to focus, um, sort of the remainder of the talk, which is why I know that we've kind of sped through things a little bit, is to, um, to talk a little about the opportunities going forward. And so we see sort of two clear opportunities for OER in the LMS. One is uh, enabling learning analytics, so to provide that data for continuous improvement and evaluation. And to really, as Bill just talked to us about, is building a, a better user experience. 
so that anyone, not someone, not an instructor who has to find someone in IT to coordinate their Blackboard administrator, to coordinate all these things to happen to be able to use a piece of OER in their LMS. So at the Open Learning Initiative, we, this is a, if you've seen us talk before, you've probably seen this slide. Um, one of our core, core ideas is that we feel one of the most powerful features of web-based instruction is this ability to embed assessment in every instructional activity and then use that data to provide feedback to the learner, to the instructor, to the course design and development team, and to the science of learning. However, right now that data, and there's, there's all this doing this, but that data gets trapped in proprietary tools. It's not, um, it doesn't flow across system boundaries, it doesn't flow across organizational boundaries. It's locked up. And you know, inside of OLA, we try to provide this comprehensive view of learning. We call it our, our instructor learning dashboard. Um, it's a way where we, we take an outcomes-focused, outcome-centered approach to giving instructors information about their students' learning. But imagine if that could be extended to all of the resources that happen, that, that happen to be in an LMS. Why can't I mix two OERs, something like my math lab or my stat lab, something I create as an instructor, and have all that data flow back to one central analytics tool that provides me that comprehensive view. And there's a lot of issues around, around this. Um, standards for data exchange. These are all things we talked about this morning. Um, licensing issues, <coughs> platforms and tools, policies. Um, but we really feel to, to, to work through all these things, um, we have to think about LMS interoperability, systems interoperability, and learning analytics as being automatic not an afterthought, not something you go back and put into a system. That when you're creating an OER as the OER creator, you shouldn't have to think about these things. The tools that you're using to author your content should do this for you. All of this stuff that we talked about, all these, these technical issues should be behind the scenes. Um, so, building a better user experience. How do we get to that component? Um, well, what, about, what if we choose a familiar model? What if we choose something that I bet everyone in here has in their pocket that's, that they're familiar with, um, which is the OER App Store idea. You know, why can't we <coughs> find OER within the LMS? Why can't we have one-click access to take something that's a complex OER, not something that's just a web-based resource, but something that has interactive learning environments and persistent states and logins and grades and sophisticated learning analytics, and just add that to a course in a really easy way? Um, we also need something that provides a basis for choice so we can choose from the myriad things that are out there, um, and, and that should have evaluation data and context of use, and a way to bring communities to those resources that are being consumed. And we think a, an app store would be one way to do this. So the question becomes, why hasn't this happened? And so I updated this slide with Sooner. I'm sure everyone in here has heard about the Pearson Open Class Announcement. Um, so we see publishers are now moving in this, this direction, um, but there isn't I know that there's some efforts, there's lots of portals and aggregators and things here, but we don't actually have in this community something that's pervasive in every learning management system that provides a really easy way to grab OER content. Again, why hasn't this happened? Probably the same issues. Institutional policies about uh, data, institutional policies about consuming resources, licensing data ownership, technology standards. Um, and the message that we want to, to leave with is that we need platforms which make it easy to create, share, find, use, and evaluate OER. And the user focus needs to be on the educators and learners who actually consume it, not on all this sort of technical stuff that happens behind the scenes. Um, we're not going to have a lot of time for discussion, but I also want to mention, if you're interested in sort of the user experience perspective that we are bringing to OERs, uh, Renee Fisher and I are talking tomorrow about that. And uh, we're also going to be touching more on the idea of OER convergence through learning analytics. Uh, we'll be talking with my colleague Norman Beer about that uh, also tomorrow. Uh, we can kind of dig in more on the uh, data standards issues there. So we hope to use the remaining time um, to, for discussion, because I think that the discussion I was really stimulating this morning. And so these are some questions that we wanted to pose to you. We almost also sure you have questions for us. But um, so things like, how does OER make greater inroads to the LMS? Do you agree with this OER App Store approach? Does this model extend, replace, supplement the content package idea that we've, we've been using so far? Uh, can open versus close, free versus commercial exist side by side in such a system? 
And what are the next steps to make this happen? Because I really believe that we all need to come together to make this type of thing happen, to actually have a place to share the great work that we're doing, share the evaluation results that work, the context of use, the pedagogical design, and make it really easy to consume in the place where educators who are looking for resources, replacing their resources, are working. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Blackboard has responded to Pearson's open class by stating that they're going to implement some kind of OER resource within their system. And, and yes, I think the App Store approach is, is a very exciting one, but part of the problem, as I see it, is there's so many resources out there. Something needs to come about that uh, organizes them in mm -hmm. a way that makes it easier to access what you're looking for. I really like the OER <coughs> Commons. I think it's a, a step forward from Merlot in that respect, although I like Merlot, but it can be just overwhelming. OER Commons is a little more, uh, I think, a step in the right direction. Yeah, and, and so we agree with that view that it's, there's a benefit to, um, that's, that's the idea of providing a basis for choice. And one way to do that is to communicate the design intentions behind resources, um, to provide communities where you can talk with folks who, who provide case studies of their use, um, to share evaluation results, concept of context of use data, all those sorts of things along with the OER. And so, and then to try to coalesce communities around similar OERs so that we can actually have convergence uh, and to actually take care of the full power of analytics. Um, real quickly, I didn't, I heard you talk a little bit about, I think most of this in respect to higher ed. Um, can you speak of any situations where you've had uh, K-12 experience with this or have you been doing anything from a K-12 perspective? I mean, I, the question I really have is, you know, addressing the first one and the last one, I think reaching out to some of your K-12 environments, it will help better perpetuate what's happening down the line. But have you had any experience with the K-12 environment yet? Uh, very limited. There's a uh, few high schools in the Pittsburgh area um, and, and elsewhere that we work with. Uh, they're using our courses and, and we engage them with this question about uh, do you have a learning management system and it, we found that actually they're using very different tools that we're not familiar with. It's, we didn't find Blackboard or, or um, Sakai or Moodle to be as common. I know there are schools that use those systems. Um, and so I think from our side we're just not as familiar with the technology that's in place there. Um, we do work with a number of high schools and it'd be interesting to if you have some insight to talk to you about uh, maybe how we can get on those platforms also. Yeah, I think a, a lot of, it's hard to argue with some vision that requires you to look here, but a lot of the tricky part comes down to the issue of standards. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, having bashed standards a little bit in the, in the opening session, <laughs> standard slides, I think it's worth taking a moment to defend uh, on the other side. So I haven't worked at a textbook company like that. And every single one of the issues that you listed as problems that you have with LTI and its current implementation are issues that we have as well. Um, and there are a couple more and so on and so forth. But what really happened there from my perspective is that a, a group of folks got around the table to solve a particular problem. And that problem was tool interoperability. It was placing a, you know, a video conferencing tool inside the LMS frame. Yep. And they solved that problem. And it turned out that the way they solved that problem brings them part way to solving the problems that you, that OLI and that Cengage and others in the content fields need to solve, but not the whole way. Yeah, so absolutely. really, and there are mechanisms with the IMS, including a thing called the conformance profile, which basically says if you want to get certified for content LTI or operability, you have to include data in these fields. There are ways of dealing with it. And the most important thing is that we get the right people around the table. So it's really important right now there for educational institutions and for foundations and for um, OER uh, consortia to step up to this table and to be involved in the working groups to articulate the use cases. I don't think there's any barrier um, other than the usual barrier that it's hard to create standards that work for everyone. I don't think there's any political barrier to solving the problems that, that you're having. We just, we just need to get the right people around the table. I'd like to just push on that just a little bit. because I, So I agree with you. And I think um, I agree with you in terms of that basically LTI originally started out for a different intent. 
Um, and I do see some, I see folks who've run with, I think the Sakai community is a great example of where they've used in Sakai 3 to bring in Sakai 2 pieces in a very uh, clean way using, using basic LTI. Um, but I, I also have seen cases where um, there'll, there'll be a standard and then a publisher will kind of extend it in a use case and then they'll kind of tweak it in some certain way and then that will, they kind of will get contributed back to the community for a while and standards stand take a long time to come out. And I want to contrast that with what happens every day in Web 2.0. Someone will skunkworks project, call up with something, put it online, it'll go viral, it'll take off, it'll be a simple web-based API, and everyone's consuming it instantly. And I just wonder why that hasn't happened in our space. Like, why isn't there, why aren't there organic standards that emerge? Why does it have to always be bringing people to the table? And, and you know, I'd love to be involved in those discussions. I mean, we have use cases. We want to fix this issue. Um, but I also just, I also question the, whether the process to date has been really uh, serving us well. Oh, so I think we're, we got the time signal, so maybe could we do one more question? Um, <coughs> yeah, here. Um, a couple of things, well, and I thought it would be quite brief. I mean, one of the things from your discussion is, do we really need the concept of no one at this point? There might be some other ways to think about it that's being mm -hmm. thought about. So that, I, would, I would just say, maybe that needs to be rethought for just a minute, and, and trying to, to attack some of these problems that we're dealing with. And another thing, dealing with standards and the, and the, the processes. Um, historically, you're absolutely right. Uh, that that has that has been the case. There's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, I will say this, however, uh, that uh, the, the the process in order is never. It's like all models; they're always wrong, but they try to be as useful as possible. Um, and they are ongoing. And I think that there are there are faster venues, and that people have recognized that problem and are, are working at this point. To try to work through those issues, there there are things in the pro in, in process that are attacking each and every one of these uh, that that may or may not be uh, a standard or maybe just web service definitions, whistles, those types of things that are all that, that are being worked with. Um, just to respond really fast, and we can you know, talk later if you have a chance. But to, to push on where I will the usability direction on that, um, I I see the installation of LMSs in so many institutions all over the world as an opportunity to take advantage of something that's there, rather than trying to develop a new solution that, although it might be better, uh, will take time to get out there. And so insofar as we can take advantage of an install base and what users are getting familiar with, whether they initially have some trouble getting familiar with Blackboard, lots of them are familiar with Blackboard now. And so can I, if you're familiar with Blackboard, get it as good as I can so I don't have to teach you anything to pull my OER into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks.